right. Uh, please rise for the pl Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right, we'll start off with the uh, student council report. Sebastian Wiese. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sebastian Wiese. I'm the student body president at Somers High School, and I'm here to give a, our monthly report on the high school. Uh, for student life, uh, this past weekend, Somers Science Research students presented projects at the Westchester Rockland Junior and Science and Humanities Symposium. Uh, several students won awards. Uh, Angie Ayubi, Connor Entenberg, and, C and Sir Sienna DeMarine has all won awards and will be advancing to, to the New York State competition in Albany. So we're really proud of all of them. Uh, a little IB update, international, uh, well, the goings of the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. The juniors, the year ones uh, of the program are currently starting their extended essays which is a 4,000 word essay I, I talked previously about, while seniors are in the middle of finishing all of their internal assessments for each of their IB classes, as well as the TOK essay. Um, Tri-M, which is our Music Honor Society, is hosting Coffee House this Friday at 4 p.m. in the Commons. I'm performing in that. We got a m bunch of amazing singers and musicians in that perform in that uh, uh, event. So it's going to be great. Uh, I invite you all to come. Uh, senior ice skating trip is to Bear Mountain. Will be held on February 15th as well. Um, for the arts, uh, auditions for the spring musical have been held and rehearsals have been have begun. This year's musical will be Adam's Family and it's just an all around good musical, I love it. Um, uh, and also a few weeks ago we had our winter, uh, winter band and guitar concert at the high school. Uh, for athletics, boys and girls indoor track and field are both league champs, so congrats to them. Ryan Cole, who will be attending Carnegie Mellon in the fall, won a Player of the Year in Class A New York State football. And Ryan Ball won his, won his 100th career wrestling match, a wonderful accomplishment for a 10th grader. Uh, prior to spring break, uh, student council held a successful winter spirit week that involved a lot of candy, hot chocolate, and our uh, fun and highly anticipated school-wide bingo. School-wide bingo is always a, a success. We have Miss O'Shea on the announcements announcing numbers as we go through the periods. It's awesome. Um, and for counseling, to end it off, we hosted our eighth grade parent information night two weeks ago and also had curriculum night last week. And counseling is also currently in the middle of Regents Week. Uh, the second sem semester at the high school started today, and counselors are currently holding junior conferences and starting scheduling conferences for students in grades eight through 10 to pick their classes for the next year. Uh, on Thursday, February 1st, the SHS Counseling Office will be holding its first FAFSA, FAFSA workshop where senior parents can complete the FAFSA uh, application with the support of one of our visiting college financial aid professionals. Information will be going home to senior parents this week with options for appointment times, and that is 100% a necessary thing, and we're so thankful for our counseling department for doing that. Just started the FAFSA, and it is something, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> IB Information Night will be held on February 8th, and lastly, uh, our eighth grade visit, uh, A Taste of High School, will be held uh, Friday, February 9th, which means we will have a half day for SHS students. And that's all on the high school. Thank you for having me. Have a nice evening. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, do we have anybody from PTA? Yeah. All right. Uh, now we move on to uh, public comment on agenda items. Nope. 
All right, uh, on to the central office report. So we're going to go ahead and start uh, with our uh, our, our uh, partners from the Westchester Police uh, team here for their SROs. So as they come to the mic, they'll repeat uh, kind of a little bit of where I'm going. But last year, uh, we had with Dan Corrado and the team brought forth an opportunity for a training for all of our faculty. And uh, I'll, I'll let you guys speak to that a little bit, but then here's a kind of a follow-up to support each one of our classrooms from a safety perspective. So thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Sergeant Jim Dress. Obviously, I'm with the Westchester County Police. I'm assigned to our community policing unit and uh, help oversee our school safety program. I'm here today with Lieutenant Mike DeMeo. He's the lieutenant of our community policing unit. And I'm here with one of your SROs, Jesse Maracalo. He's assigned to the middle school. Before I explain why we're here, we have actually a presentation for you. Just want to give a shout out to Ryan Cole. He's one of our uh, advisor, or cadet leaders in our cadet program. So fantastic kid. And um, we're very proud of him as well. So if he's watching tonight, great job, Ryan. <laughs> Sure he is. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Dr. Blanche, and certainly work with Chris and Dan. Uh, we are here tonight to make a presentation to the Somer School District. Uh, we made this presentation to all the school districts that we serve in the county. Um, we have a very forward-leaning posture in partnership with the Somer School District in terms of safety and preparedness. So one of the things that we uh, did already with your district and will continue to do it is training. We want to be able to provide immediate responder training to the staff in your school, because really in a critical incident or uh, an emergency in your school, it's the teachers and the staff who are going to be first on scene. A lot of people call us the first responders, but really in a school environment, you all are the immediate responders. So in that vein, uh, we have secured a grant, a uh, community preparedness grant for uh, deluxe stop the bleed kits for emergencies for hemorrhage control. Um, these are actually becoming as common as AEDs and fire extinguishers. We have about a dozen stop the bleed kits, so there's a, basically a kit for each one of your buildings, and then you can deploy them as you wish. Um, all our school resource officers wear a tourniquet on their belts, and just so you have a better understanding about how the tourniquet works and how easy it is to apply in, a, in an emergency where there's a hemorrhage. So or just, address, was this where you needed the demonstration? Yes, yeah, so well, I'm going to have there. Lieutenant DeMeo and uh, Officer Maracalo come up. I'm going to need, <laughs> we're going to need to borrow one of your arms if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I know how they work. <laughs> So if you can uh, just anticipate community that this is where our school resource <laughs> officer team came last year to all, our entire faculty and, and, and had faculty members going through this, identifying partners side by side, doing the whole whole uh, process. During this year. So just imagine hundreds of our employees going through this. So thank you, Jess. The tourniquets are usually only applied to the arms or the legs. You don't apply to the chest, neck, or head area. So the tourniquet will be applied above the wound. And it's around. Then we rotate a bit. A little, little, little tighter. <laughs> <laughs> Not tight enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then once it's applied, we leave it on until the, the paramedics or the hospital kicks off. You can leave these on for 12 hours, 14 hours. It's not the myth is if you leave it on too long, it's a possible to lose a limb. That's that's a fallacy. Uh, you want to go as high as possible, you leave it on as long as possible. Uh, overseas in the military, they've had them on as long as, you know, 24 hours, and then they were able to recover. Uh, obviously, we're going to get the medical care much faster in Westchester County, uh, but you just tighten it down until the bleeding stops, and you can leave it on uh, until all the way to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we certainly give uh, the Somer School District props because this immediate responder training that we're able to work with your district and provide your staff, this is just one component. The other uh, trainings that we provide or help you provide CPR, AED, uh, Narcan for opioid overdose, um, and certainly stop the bleed with the tourniquets. Uh, we've gone through that with all your staff, so um, this is just um, an added layer of uh, a resource for you to deploy to your schools. God forbid there's an emergency. This, this is a life-saving device, and it's very simple to apply as Lieutenant and Officer Maracalla was able to demonstrate. So we appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here tonight. We uh, very much um, ap appreciate our partnership with the school district, and we look forward to working with Dan and Chris and the superintendent 
uh, for any future training that we could provide to further uh, enhance the safety um, of your students and staff. So thank you very much. Thanks, Sergeant Tressa. And if it's all right, we may just take a pause for a moment, take sure. a quick picture. Before, okay. yeah, oh, yeah, before we do that, I just want to thank on behalf of you know the school district and the community, thank you for everything you guys do, the, the not only here at the schools and supporting us day in and day out, the training you guys are doing, you know, outside, the training you're doing for us, you know, like you said, for us to be the first responders, our teachers uh, and administrators. Um, can't thank you enough and just keeping, you know, our kids uh, of the community, you know, safe. So thank you very much. Thanks. You're, just, I mean, just so you know, your school district, we, we, we service a lot of school districts. We have a good partnership with all our schools, but you really are on the higher uh, spectrum of somewhat of a gold standard in terms of safety with all the training that you've received, the equipment, um, the technology. So you're definitely a very um, forward-leaning school district in terms of safety, and we very much appreciate that partnership. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And just to reiterate, that never goes around the neck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to take a quick picture? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, yeah. Sergeant. Thank you, Paul. Thank we'll take a quick break. All right. Now we're on to the uh, proposed 2024 no, we're on the uh, comprehensive facility plan. Yes. So tonight I'll go ahead and maybe a second turn over to Chris, but we have, uh, as we're looking at uh, the facilities plan, and we know right now we have some projects going on right now. This is an update of our five-year kind of a comprehensive plan for our facilities and things. So we'll go ahead and ask uh, kind of Mike to come forward. And anything else you want to add, Chris, as we start this work? Yeah, I just want to thank Mike Lantier and H2M for all the work that they've put into this plan. It has really helped... Uh, guide us on our thinking for our next big capital project that we're going to be entertaining in a in a year or so. And so we'll go ahead and we've got a nice PowerPoint that Mike's going to walk us through, but please we'll address questions and things like that as we go along the way. And then um, as uh, Chris had mentioned before, this allows us to really structurally and systemically look at the needs of the organization. And as we've talked over the last probably two years, identifying in 2025 in May, looking at bringing on the next bond as one feathers off and bring the other one on so we have maintaining uh the same level of of reserve of debt that we would have in in, the, in those uh bond funds but not uh, going beyond or doing that so our goal is to have a have a kind of tax neutral impact uh, so bring that through so thank you mike thank you dr blanche um, thank you chris uh, thank you board it's a pleasure uh to be here uh, like the police officer just mentioned as well we have um great working relationships with a lot of our school districts, but when I first came to Somers, um, probably about six six years or so ago, um, it was clear, I mean, you guys are the gold standard. Um, from my view, from an engineering and an architectural perspective, your buildings have been very well taken care of um, for, for, for decades at this point. Um, you're very proactive about the work um, that you perform on your schools as well. Unfortunately, with that being said, we still have a lot of square footage across the district and, 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 and the buildings um, are range in, in age as well. Um, so as part of my role uh, with H2M architects and engineers is to uh, evaluate your buildings. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background on our company if you want to go to the next slide, Chris. Um, so H2M architects and engineers, we're just a multidisciplined architectural engineering firm. Um, we have about 500 professionals. Out of those 500 professionals, about 75 dedicate their career working strictly for K through 12 and, and higher education clients. Um, we're, your district is primarily served out of three of our offices, Melville, Suffern, and Westchester, our, which is our White Plains office. Uh, depending on the type of engineer or, the, or, or architect that we need, that would dictate which office um, they come from. We basically offer every type of architectural engineering service uh, under one roof, probably with the exception of, of, of nuclear engineering. Um, really, we have uh, all of those resources available to us um, under one company, um, which makes my life a little bit easier. Um, but moving forward, um, some of the work that we have completed, uh, H2M personally for the district over the last uh, six, six years or so ago, uh, was the district-wide safety and security bond, uh, some electrical service upgrades. Again, I won't go into too much detail and read everything on the slides. Um, I'm sure it's been a long day for all of us. Um, we are currently uh, about to break ground on a really exciting athletic uh, upgrade to the elementary school and, and the high school. Really, as soon as the ground thaws, um, those projects will, will begin. 
Uh, just some quick pictures of what your current team looks like. Uh, our team leaders right now, this is a civil engineer, mechanical, a water resource engineer, uh, a couple architects, and then a structural and, and, and another civil engineer as well, just to put some faces uh, behind the team. So the comprehensive plan process, what this looks like on our end, um, every, every five years the state education department requires every school district to do a building condition survey. Uh, your last survey was done in 2019, so this started really as, as, as my team's basis. We take a look at that report as we're walking every facility and every square foot, and we look at what items have been completed, what items still need to be completed, what items have gotten worse and need to be a, a different priority level. Um, and then we have additional discussions with administration, um, with staff, and, and we kind of decide what are some possible future needs. So in front of you is the full comprehensive plan. Uh, there's every line item that we felt should be included with detailed information and detailed costs and priority levels uh, included in the, in the spiral bound uh, plan in front of you. Uh, when we do our walkthroughs, we typically look at the systems on, uh, on six different bases, uh, interior systems, exterior systems, uh, your site, and then your water systems, you know, your typical utilities, your HVAC, and, and your electrical systems. Um, and as needed, we have uh, specialized engineers come out and look at any, any items that, that may, may require additional detail or have additional uh, questions. And then moving on, after we've formulated some existing conditions that need improvement, then we talk about future needs. And uh, some of these future needs are included in, in the plan in front of you, and um, that plan's gonna continue to be uh, really prioritized move, moving forward. So to take a look at the, um, at the next slide, the work completed since the 2019 building condition survey, uh, this is not just work completed with H2M, this is uh, facilities upgrades that uh, your district has specifically undertaken. Uh, it includes uh, a, a number of projects under the energy performance contract, uh, like I mentioned before, your security and safety bond upgrades, and then some, some, compre uh, some, capital, uh, some capital improvements as well. And it, it equaled just, just under $20 million. Uh, and for, for a district of this size, that's, that's, that's a good amount of, of money to spend and, and, and to put into your, to your facilities, just to put it into perspective a little bit. So the next slide just talks about current facilities and, and the building's age. The reason I, I include this slide is because, um, you know, everyone can walk around and say the buildings look great. I, you know, I don't understand how, how is there the need for so much additional construction and, and, and additional cost uh, to upgrade our facilities. But when you start to look at the numbers, and you know, the district has been very proactive with doing large, large scale upgrades. And that's why when you'll see uh, the, the, the additional years, uh, starting off with your uh, original construction and then either addition or large renovation. Um, but even when we look at that, you know, some of your larger renovations have been, you know, 15 plus years. And, and unfortunately, you know, we all know that buildings continue to, to degrade. Um, you'll also see on that slide, I'm sorry, Chris, um, you'll also see on that slide is the transportation facility and your, and your wastewater treatment facility. Uh, my firm did go and uh, take a look, uh, a deep dive into those facilities as well. Um, as far as your, your wastewater treatment facility, that is owned and operated by the school district, but most of the associated costs with that uh, are paid by uh, the DEP or the DEC. So as you uh, go into the comprehensive plan um, that you have in front of you, you'll see different priorities. Uh, there's a priority explanation. It's priority one, two, three, and four. Priority one is really your emergency items, life safety items. Uh, the good news is, is there are no uh, priority level one items in your comprehensive plan. Uh, number two is, is really health and safety or property damage related. Uh, typically that's weatherization of your buildings to help protect uh, the building itself. Um, and then three is something that would be age related or, uh, or required by a new code. Uh, and then priority four is really a desirable upgrade, uh, something that's a wish list item you know, or, or a potential future need of the school district. Uh, your overall building rating definitions um, that you'll see, there's an explanation in the beginning. Uh, you have excellent, satisfactory, unsatisfactory, and failing. Uh, all of your items did fall under satisfactory. Um, a lot of times we'll get some pushback and say, what do you mean we're only satisfactory? You know, we're an A-plus school district. 
but the reality is even new construction is very rarely rated excellent. Um, so satisfactory is actually a, a, a good report to have on a, on a comprehensive building condition plan. So getting into the numbers, um, I don't want anyone to fall off their seats, but there, but but you know, there's there's there, there's a lot of work that's included in there. Um, priority two, uh, which is your your highest need items right now, uh, luckily is the lowest of, of the needs. Um, priority three has a number of additional items in there. We'll go into a little bit detail in a minute. And then, like I mentioned, your priority four is possible future needs, um, possible wish list items, and this number can go up and can go come down um, as we as we move forward. Just prioritizing in, in, in the next months and and the next year or so. Um, also included, I'm sorry. Also included in that dollar value is uh, some uh, is a uh, uh, some conservative numbers, but also uh, it includes uh, some contingencies. It includes uh, building contingencies, design constru uh, construction contingencies, as well as soft costs, um, and then some inflation for anticipated construction cost increases. Uh, moving on to uh, the first school summary. I, again, I won't go into too much detail because you're going to see a lot of the same information from building to building coming up. Um, there's significantly more detail in the plan in front of you, but what you're going to see most of the time for your for your interior work is ceiling upgrades, uh, various flooring upgrades. Uh, your exterior is uh, really some minor weatherization. That's uh, some facade uh, repointing, uh, some minor roof work. Um, and then some facade repairs. Moving on to your site work, that is one of your larger numbers across the district, um, just due to the <coughs> age uh, and the condition of your asphalt, your sidewalks, uh, your walkways. Um, it's 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 time to do a, a, a you know pretty pretty big upgrade to maintain the current the current condition and really to upgrade the the, the current condition before it gets significantly worse. Um, your water systems, various improvements, uh, some are treatment related and some are age related. Uh, HVAC systems, again, you'll see some uh, rooftop units or some other HVAC units were deemed either non operable or um, just uh, they're, they're older than their, than their useful life expectancy, so they're recommended for upgrades as well. And then uh, similarly to your electrical systems, um, everything was in satisfactory condition. There's been a number of electrical service upgrades across the district, but there still are some components that we would recommend to be proactive to replace because we're reaching that. 50, 60, 70 plus year for some of the for some of the equipment. Uh, moving on to the intermediate school, like I mentioned, it's it's going to be this really the same items. Um, nothing nothing really um, that's that 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 stands out specifically for for really any of the schools besides your your typical upgrades that are detailed in the packet in front of you. Uh, moving on to the middle school. Again, very very similar. Um, we included some drainage some drainage improvements in this one, a propane tank replacement. Um, again, flooring upgrades, ceiling, uh, some window upgrades. Moving on to your high school. Again, everything satisfactory upgrades um, and 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 more of the same. Flooring, facade, the 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 present uh, the program in front of you really goes into individual line item detail. Um, the next item is the transportation area. Uh, very, very minor. Um, we recommended some drainage upgrades. Uh, we recommended asphalt uh, upgrades and some curb, some curb replacement in that area. And then on the interior, some, some, some heating, um, some, some, some electrical or IT upgrades as well. And then moving on to your wastewater treatment facility. Again, that was that that facility is one of the newest. Uh, throughout the district and had had the least amount of, of of items that we would include in your in your comprehensive plan. So when we talk about the next steps, uh, it's really the, primarily is prior, prioritization of the projects. Uh, we've had a number of meetings with administration teachers, and those meetings will continue um, with some additional committees um, and really prioritizing. Uh, the really the final scope of work uh, to move forward. Uh, we would look at that really in two two separate areas. One is facilities, uh, where me and my team really take over and 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 we take we can we can help prioritize that even further. And then the educational aspect, um, which which Dr. Blanche can can talk about a little bit more. 
Um, I don't know if you want to talk now. Yeah, that's you want great, to Mike. So I think that uh, you hopefully can see the, the kind of bifurcation here that we're talking about with, uh, again, a heavy lift as far as the uh, paving and, and, and road work and things like that have to take care of as well as some of the HVAC and the electrical parts. So the majority of that, as uh, Mike was saying back in the beginning with the kind of over our kind of zones of our uh, work areas of one, two, and three. So not all of it, but the majority land in the uh, second and third columns that we have there. And then a good portion of that area of four is when we're talking as far as updating our learning spaces to kind of a more modern space. So if you're looking at our, just our general classrooms, uh, looking at quite frankly, like our, our playground access outside for our elementary schools and upgrading those large playground spaces. Um, our STEM classrooms and such that need to be kind of overhauled, our general science classrooms. And so that's that kind of remodeling, I guess you would say, if you were in your, if you're home and you work, you know, bought that home was in the 70s, and you walk in, it still looks like the 70s, you're probably gonna get rid of some of those avocado kind of colored countertops and some of those things. So that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about. Those are not things that are breaking, the classrooms are fine, the roofs are good, and all those things like Mike was saying before, but it is an opportunity to kind of bring that learning experience into the 21st century. And so uh, what we're doing right now, myself and the billing leadership and the different teams that we're going through on our general operating budget, having a conversation with the teacher leadership groups in each one of the buildings and working with our PTAs across the buildings and looking at basically what are those elements that we want to ensure they're intact next year in the regular 24, 25 budget. We'll be coming back later in the spring and talking about what are some of the things you would truly like to enhance in, in the schools. And it always comes up and they say, well, what about our playgrounds, as it did last night with one of the PTAs. So kind of take that, put that to the side. So we'll be back later in the spring to talk about those overall enhancements and things like that. So just to let you know, that's kind of that differential. And when we mean design for learner engagement, the classroom of today really in, needs and should look differently. We've been looking at how do you just have different furniture in our classrooms, more flexible furniture in the classrooms and things. So we've been slowly but surely working on that, but you're really talking about, you know, look around our space right now, furniture that's been in here for decades has really needed to go ahead and be updated into that kind of modern experience. So that's where Mike and I will kind of work on the team and Chris and the team with the buildings and the grounds and all that work, we'll work on the, uh, making sure the building envelope part is done and we're talking about the kind of the educational part of that. So but we'll be working through the spring to continue to get feedback from our, you know, our typical structures, working with our teacher leadership teams. Some of those will break out, like Mike was saying before, hey, we have a very unique learning space inside of here. For example, like our science labs, those are different than a typical classroom, so we work with our science teachers on those. So that would be coming through late in the spring, summer, and in the fall, as we hope to then start putting forth in the fall, roughly this time next year, where what we're hoping and desiring to do, take care of the bidding envelope, and then what we can go ahead and enhance. We would not be able to get this size of a number, but again, as Mike said before, it's just what do we all see inside of there, and then we'll prioritize there from working with the faculty and the uh, different family groups and things. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, and then the next step is is identifying the, the funding sources. Uh, we're currently working with your, your fiscal advisor as well, um, and we're discussing a potential May 2025 bond. The reason for that timing is there is uh, a, a, an older bond retiring at that time, so any any work moving forward is anticipated to be to be tax neutral. So so no additional costs uh, for the community. And then there would be some money available to do these upgrades in, in your capital reserve fund as well um, and then uh, along with that process is really finalizing that scope like we discussed and prioritizing based upon the available budget uh, and then communicate this across to the public so they're well aware of what of what we're, we're including and what the intentions are and the associated costs and the associated schedule and, and timeline um, and then at, at, at some point that would uh, result in, in hopefully a public vote, and then if that public vote is approved, then we would go through to the design and the, the New York State education process, and then ultimately uh, construction. So that's really it on my end. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, um, but I'm, I'm glad to answer any questions. Um, I, I have been through with my team really every square foot of your building, so I do know them pretty well, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any, any questions that you may have. How, how true are the costs for these projects that you have here? So they are they're 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 accurate in today's what we're seeing in in today's 
construction values so um, like based off trends so what we do in my firm yeah we have we have ongoing lists of publicly bid projects which there there are quite quite a number of them so then we look at some of the most recent recent projects and we look at the trends and then we come up with okay if we're going to be here in this time we think that the size of the project is this this is the dollar va value that we're associating with it and then we include um, I don't remember off the top of my head but I believe we include a 15 percent contingency on top of that as well after we include any of our associated soft costs. So what is like the percentage of, I want to say error, but what is the percentage of how much these could be off these numbers? We're in a tough, we're in a, we're in a very tight, tough place right now with construction costs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that these numbers are conservative that we're putting out there because we're just seeing as we put this plan together, we're seeing some of the highest construction costs that we've historically seen. Um, the good news is, is we are seeing a lot of those costs finally either starting to come down or, or really level off. So if it get, when it gets closer, things get approved, you actually go out and get specific estimates on how much these things are going to cost? So we do. We do it a number, a number of different ways. Um, as we go into our design process, there's typically like a, a, at least a 50% and then a 90% cost, cost uh, reallocation. So we look at that current detailed scope of work. Um, right now, I need to generalize, I need to make assumptions because there hasn't been detailed design work done in, 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 in many of the cases. Um, and then we go back as we get into the design and we look at the budget that we had appropriated for that item and where and where do we currently stand. So we should have a good idea before that goes out. Um, and that's done using current, current uh, bids. That's done with cost estimators through a construction manager. Um, and then that's done also going out to, to, to contractors for specific items and getting their take on it. So based on the time frame, it could be considerably more. So it can be, and, and that's a discussion that um, Dr. Blanche and, and Chris a, a, and I had as well. Um, and when we look at the time frames, um, you know, if, if I was doing this three or four years ago, you would see more of a projection out in your in your work from 2025, 2026, 2027, and there would be additional cost factors included in, in those. Um, in this case, it, we felt like it was more appropriate to only look out one year. Uh, we included a cost factor, a cost increase, I believe, of 4% for uh, that one year of increase in, in the construction costs. All right, so it's safe to say that you don't, you're not going to have a true number until you get the go-ahead to do what this is. Yeah, so the, the timing for us to really know what the exact number is is after we collect the public bids after we have the design process but i mean what we do as part of that process too is we include uh, a number of alternates in the projects too so we make sure that we can award whatever we can afford um, whatever whatever the budget allows uh, besides the uh, we uh, uh, funded through a bond do you know any other public assistance uh, available resources so um, you, you currently have used your, your the energy performance contract as another means um, that's, that's, that's done typically through a loan as well. Um, but it would be really through the bond process or, or, or a, transfer, a transfer to capital. I don't know if that, if that answered your question or if Any there was- from the state? Oh, an additional, an additional grant. So, so there's, mm -hmm. typically, there's typically not many that school districts are eligible for. Um, I, I don't want to speak out of line, but with certain, there are newer tax incentives, believe it or not. I know it, t school districts are, 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 are a tax-free entity, but um, depending on uh, your energy performance contract or a future energy performance contract, there are things that we as a firm do look into and we coordinate with your f fiscal advisor as well to see if you would qualify for, for some of those opportunities. Um, for example, some of the op some of the items in the comprehensive plan, one of them as a priority four, included large scale photovoltaics, um, and that's something that could be um, part of a second phase of an energy performance contract, um, and then that's something that could be eligible for additional R IRA aid, um, and then depending on the timing and what's available, there there are typically grants uh, or rebates associated with the local utility as well. Um, there was another item on there as well. Um, your e we included a couple EV bus charging stations as well. Uh, we kept it on the small scale. Uh, I think we only included four chargers for a short-term project. 
um, but there most likely would be some kind of funding assistance associated with that, but we're still, the state's still trying to sort out what that looks like. But we are proactive about looking into opportunities. And I think that more you just described there, Mike, too, this piece we've been talking about, about the photosynthetic cells as far as working that through. And then if we look at the Elast Energy Performance contract, that was a $8.9 million project. And basically by the uh, savings of that we're working that through, uh, that doesn't increase any expenditures out to the uh, school district. And so the reality is we're reallocating those expenditures now to go ahead and and pay off that kind of lease piece, but in the end, we actually do have a little bit of a positive variance and that. So again, we hope <laughs> that this piece is uh, going to be something we look at after if we if we go ahead and look at those solar panels and things. And and we know that before the um, COVID pandemic, uh, our uh, kilowatt charge per hour was a, a little bit better than it is today. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, because those rates have gone up, we might actually be looking at that project. So again. I appreciate you working with our team and kind of giving some preliminary numbers there to look at. We won't know, like you said, until it gets a little closer down the road if actually there are other incentives, but it certainly seems like both from a state and a federal level, there are folks are trying to move more to that, so I think we've got ourselves well primed, and I know we looked at our roofing situation, our roofs are healthy and would allow us to do those things. So again, it's a, Correct. It's a very comprehensive look, and I, I know your team has done it. We've followed you many times around and been <laughs> in their boiler rooms and up on the roofs yeah, and things like that. So, <laughs> so I, I, again, I appreciate the thoroughness uh, of the team's work for sure. Absolutely. There'll be a time period where we get together and see what's absolutely necessary, like what has to get done and what could be pushed aside to another time. Yeah, so as the detailed piece that you would have in there from the current assessment, you will see where, like that priority two, those would be our first series right. that we would hit. Mm -hmm. Priority three is the next, and then priority four are really those we would we feel we'd like to look and redesign some of our spaces or the solar panel. So as we inch towards closer, yes, we'll have a significant amount of conversations as we identify, much like our, our last energy performance contract. We would have liked to have done more, um, we didn't get it all just because it, there, at a point we were uh, not going to break even at least. So it would be the same thing in here. Yeah. And, and I guess just to add a little bit more too, because um, some of these projects that we do do become enormous in scale. I mean, on, on, on your end, it's, 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 it's within range um, where we are monetarily, but some, some school districts that we go into, the number is so excessive that we're not talking about a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. We're, we're really putting together a 15-year plan or a 20-year plan. And that's something that we would most likely do here. You know, the items that would fall off to a lower priority that, that, that we're not currently able to budget for would be something as part of like a phase two comprehensive plan. I'm really glad you shared that, Mike, because again, too, in the document your team provided, you, the, the board can go through and see the items that were covered since the last five-year plan. <laughs> yep. And so, look, those were our priorities. Those were taken care of. And now those other ones were maybe a four before, a three, now there are three or a two. So it just kind of keeps cycling itself down. So I appreciate sharing that because that detail's in there too. It's highlighted. Look, that was an identified need in the five-year cap plan, and it was taken care of over here through the energy performance contract. And so we would kind of walk that same path through. So that's a great example. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so you're saying that then priority two are stuff that you're highly recommending to get done within this five-year span because those are higher priorities, obviously, but then priority three, we can maybe kick some of those down to more of a 10-year piece is what you're saying. Co correct. I would absolutely recommend getting the priority twos done sooner rather than later and most of the priority threes, um, but there are opportunities, yes, to push some of the priority threes a, a little bit further down. Okay. And again, so the num the ballpark number that we're anticipating as those bonds come off from the from the last project in uh, in 2009, um, those over go over a couple of years, and then we'll use a a band note to go ahead and help kind of fill the gap there. So it's usually a three years that will bring one three years to take it off, and three years to bring the next one on. And so the reality is, we're estimating the overall project size will be approximately 65 million dollars. So the reality of 100, we, that's no, well doing. beyond that. So we're looking at, yeah. here's the kind of the kitty that we have at roughly about 65 million. When we get to that closer pot, we've got the prioritized numbers from the team. And then at that point in time, we'll be looking through that from priority one to two to three. And then there's always a little conversation between the two and three numbers and saying, for us and for our district, what is a priority? If we happen to get the opportunity to do another energy performance contract, that may help. 
to help close the gap and things like that. But that's that's roughly the number we're talking about that will be available to the organization and thinking about not increasing any taxes to the community. It's just kind of holding that neutral. So that's the number that we're working okay. with as far as a revenue stream. Expenditures are well over that, but again, it's not intended in that bond in 2025 20, May to solve all of this. This is, a, again, like you said, a, five, 10, 15 year plan for sure. And then you will see in here that we have completed many, many things that were in the last year 50 capital plan. And then now it's moving to the next set. So. Reimagining the, some of the learning spaces. Yes. What kind of a time frame do you imagine with that? I mean, is some of that within the five years potentially, or is this is some of that really getting down the road? A little so the, the intent or the desire would be, I think we'll be able to have uh, some of that inside of, of that bond for 2025. How much of it, we'll have to figure out, mm -hmm. you know, and we're looking at hopefully around the corner, because Mike mentioned before, we've got a fair amount of paving. Do we have to just groove that, or do we have to go to a much deeper piece? So we're hoping to do some boring on that here shortly to determine exactly what that looks like across the district. That will help us understand what kind of commitment we need there. Obviously, HVAC and any of those other things are kind of priority. Um, the reality with much of our changes, we're talking about things like more flexible furniture. Which, so if that happens, we're able to do that, that can actually move fairly quickly because you're, we're not really doing uh, we're not adding additions and things like that, so that's not that kind of a You're large project. State. What's that? You're not waiting on the state to approve your plans. Yeah, so those would be parts <laughs> that's hopefully some of the things that we don't, because some of that planning, it's a really good point. We were just talking about the other day with uh, our team and, and other districts as well, is that continue to be slower and slower. Yeah. And so the Mike and the team really, I think, uh, got our project, uh, the most recent project up there uh, really quickly, and we were able to find success for the time we worked. So, but I would say yes, uh, Chad, we would have some element in there. And I'm hearing already from the elementaries and particular parents, the playgrounds of the four, item four things, that's a priority right there. So that more than likely, if, if classrooms are that, at least what I'm hearing so far is at the elementary levels, those uh, significantly updated playgrounds would be one that would, would kind of fall up front. So not that the other pieces don't matter, but that was one that certainly seems to resonate with, uh, you know, our families and things for sure. Okay, thank you. So we will have many more conversations <laughs> about this in the coming uh, coming months and, and things like that as we walk through it. So thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate it, sir. Thank, thank you. you. All right, next up, Chris, 2024-25 budget. All right, so tonight is uh, our budget presentation on our non-instructional budget. Uh, a few of the items that we're gonna touch upon here is just the budget development process as we do in, in all these meetings. And then we're gonna hit some of the non-instructional areas, audit, legal, and insurances, uh, technology, buildings and grounds, safety and security uh, is encompassed in the buildings and grounds budget, and then transportation. And then one of our biggest uh, buckets here is our benefits. So again, just to quickly go over the budget cycle, uh, kind of in the planning and preparation phase right now, um, we have a lot of meetings with different uh, stakeholders throughout the district, uh, including PTAs, Citizens Finance Committee, um, faculty and staff, and then we take a lot of these, and then we go to our kind of review and coordinate cycle, uh, part of the phase where we compile all the insights, and then we have to then look to prioritize, prioritize some of those budget desires, and then look to prepare a budget for the board to adopt in April. And then obviously then leading to a vote in May. And again, just as a reminder, when building this budget, just as in years past, the budget must be a balanced budget, so revenues must equal expenditures when we put it out there. Um, again, some of your biggest revenues, property taxes, state aid, sales tax, some of your biggest expenses, salaries and benefits, transportation, and debt service. So the first area we're gonna talk about tonight is our legal audit and insurance budget. So, and in each one of these sections, we have the 2022-23 expenses, and then we have the 2023-24 budget numbers, and then what we're proposing for the 2024-25 budget. Um, you could see audit and legal. There is some variance from year to year, um, mainly in the legal aspect of that, depending on how much we 
um, have to utilize our attorneys that we have um, for the district. The audit numbers are fairly consistent. We have, uh, we put out an RFP for our internal audit, our external auditing, and our internal claims auditor. So we typically know what those costs are gonna be for the next few years. And then insurances in this section, we're not talking about health insurance. We're talking about our kind of general commercial liability insurance, um, our auto insurance, our cyber security insurance, student accident insurance. And we have seen a significant increase over the last few years and that's not just to SOMERS, that's statewide. Um, many of these insurance companies have had to raise rates as more claims have been coming in. And we're gonna jump over to the technology budget. Um, and again, so in, years, in the last couple years at this meeting, we've had an operations update um, which was provided by our Director of Technology, um, Director of Facilities, Safety and Security Coordinator, Transportation Director. So we've kind of uh, encompassed those updates now right into the budget presentation. So I'll start with the first few slides and then I'll turn over the last couple slides over to each department head. Uh, so again, here we have, we're showing what our overall technology budget looks like, salaries, um, in this code specifically, we've had some real reallocation and reclassification of some support staff um, that were in-house SOMERS district employees that are now budgeted over with Edutech, who is our um, IT management company. And we have some equipment, service agreements, and contractual. I'll touch upon that a little bit more even in the next slide. That is where we budgeted Edutech for the last couple years, and now Edutech is now gonna be budgeted over in the BOCES service line, which is why you see a significant increase from the 23-24 budget to the 24-25 budget. But again, I'll go into a little bit more detail as to why uh, such a large increase in that specific area. Then you see on the lease purchase, the last couple years, uh, once Edutech came on board, they helped develop a five-year um, technology plan and we've been putting a few more dollars into that lease purchase line to help with some of the infrastructure upgrades that they have identified that um, SOMERS should look at. Um, so again, just that BOCES service line, it's going up just over you know, 1.3 million, and the majority of that cost is associated with Edutech, and that is what I will talk about on this slide here. So we moved Edutech, we had previously been paying them directly as a contractor, and now they signed on with one of the BOCES in the state, so we can go through BOCES now for their services. So for next year, what this slide is showing, that first column is Edutech direct costs, that is if an estimate of what the cost would be for Edutech if we continued paying them directly and not going through BOCES. Uh, we were in the last year of our agreement with them, so we would have had to gone out to another uh, request for proposal, and just based on conversations that we had with the vendor over the last few years, we know that those costs would have substantially increased. Um, but in these numbers, we put a 10% increase, and then we also added in the new position uh, that is with Edutech and the reallocation of the employee that used to work for Somer School District and now works for Edutech. So then that second column is what the cost is going to be for Edutech with all those positions by going through BOCES. Uh, there's no aid on this in the first year. And you see the net Edutech cost uh, going through BOCES is the same as that second column there. And you see that uh, it's costing us an, an additional almost $375,000 this year. Why is there no aid the first year? Is it just lagging? Yep, the way BOCES aid works is the, you get the services one year and then you'll receive the aid the following year. Which then brings me down to the 25-26 school year. Assuming a 5% increase in cost if we directly went with Edutech, the Edutech costs through BOCES now for the next four years are flat. We know what those are gonna be. They're not going to increase, which is very helpful budgeting wise. So we won't see any additional increase. And now you see in that third column, that estimated BOCES aid, that is our estimate based on what we're paying for Edutech through BOCES. So when you net that out, you see the net Edutech cost going through BOCES is about 775,000 for that school year. And then that puts us in the positive variance of just about $190,000. And now we'll do that for the next two years and we continue to see 
the, the variance increase the savings that we're seeing by going through Edutech. As you see, the Edutech cost through BOCES does not rise. We already know those are flat fees for the next four years. But if we, if we went directly with Edutech, we would have had to uh, account for an increase. So while there's an upfront cost, we see savings in the back end. Yeah. And so, then yep. also, the, you're, you're making a very conservative estimate of what the Edutech cost would be paying if we were paying them directly. To yeah, I would not be surprised if that amount would have been more if we had to go out, because they were talking 20 to 30 percent increases. Um, Again, yes, I did go with a conservative number of 10% and then increased it 5% each year after that. So then on the prior slide, let me see the total technology proposal for next year. If we were to look out the year after that, then it would start to include the aid we get back from BOCES. Yeah, the aid we'll get back will then show up on our revenue side. Mm. Um, so, the, but the cost now mm. you won't right. see that okay. large cost we'll now. We'll see that year. It's going to be, be the revenue. Okay. but it's going to be budgeted, and we know that that's a flat cost for Edutech. So that cost is not going up for the next four years. Right. And if we weren't going with BOCES and just going with Edutech, that same amount would be showing up. It's just it would be up under the service agreements and yep. the contractual. Correct. So again, over the four-year period we're looking at, uh, it'll end up saving the district almost three hundred fifty thousand um, dollars with having the same service that and if instead of if we did it directly with them and you see the payback period is less than three years um, you know because in that 26 27 year we're already making more than what we kind of the hit that we're kind of taking for this 24 25 school year because of the lag in the eight that it's a year behind well, and Chris, and I know we were probably going to get to this, so I might be jumping ahead, but the but we're also shifting a position over to Edutech, too, so then we're not on, uh, responsible for paying benefits and everything for that employee. So that's almost the savings in a way? Yep, or? so I'll just move on right okay. to the next slide. It's just some of the advantages of moving Edutech to BOCES. So we do have the new position there, and these legacy costs are now avoided as well. So employees that retire from the district, we um, you know, we're in, we're, might be paying health insurance when they retire. We, and while they're working, we would have a um, retirement system, whether they're in ERS or TRS, and we won't have any of those additional costs uh, moving forward with that new position over there. And then the, rea yeah, the reallocation of the one. And again, uh, another one is the four years of fixed costs. So knowing that it's not going to go uh, increase for four years is very helpful um, when come come budgeting time. So and I just want to check, you've said this five times. This is an exciting thing for you to know this that. This is That's, exciting. Okay, just check. <laughs> this is, uh, it's fantastic to, to have a number yeah, four right. years out that it is good. it's not going anywhere. So, um, And again, so net savings over that four-year period for us is almost $350,000. Mm -hmm. Again, we'll be receiving the same service that we are receiving currently. Uh, Chris, uh, about the same service, how many other district, district use Edutech or through BOCES? Through BOCES. Uh, I know there were a couple districts in the area that moved them, uh, moved some of their positions over there this year. Um, so are we, I mean, getting a sort of same share of services uh, as this move made? Because if other district is also using, obviously BOCES will, you know, sort of a multitasking and sharing. Do we get the same service? Yeah, so I'll talk about the, I'll actually ask Kim to come up and talk about the staff that we have on site mm -hmm. for SOMERS. So that's not going to change. So the staff that we have on site is still going to be here. And then we, there are some uh, back end employees uh, that are not listed in the next slide, but those kind of don't just work specifically with SOMERS, they do work with other districts as well. But on site support is going to remain the same same staffing levels that we currently have. Okay. Then my second question is then, do you know how uh, BOCES uh, is uh, able to maintain a flat cost sort of a so, program like this? Yeah, so um, it was one of the BOCES that put out an, a request for proposal for these types of services. And this is the response, this is what the proposal. There's no clause proposal. built in that no. eventually no. add some Increases? Nope. For the next four years, it's flat. They will, at the end of that term, go out for another request for proposal, just like we would have had to do if we weren't going to move our services to BOCES. Um, and then at that rate, yes, then I do expect an increase um, in that fifth year. But again, for the next four years, there will not be an increase. Okay. 
All right, so, um, so now I'm gonna ask Kim Blau, our Director of Technology, to come up and just talk about the next few slides that we have here. Hello, everyone. I'm not used to having a mic in front of me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. I just want to go over some of the details. I'm not going to cover all the bullet points, but just the things that have changed. Um, so like Chris me mentioned on the first slide, uh, we're moving, uh, one of the things that I like to point out, we're moving the one Somers position to Edutech as a level two. Um, and then we added a new position this year as well. Um, that uh, as a level one that was not, you know, uh, that we didn't have last year. So that's, that's just a change here. So Chris, you can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So here I just want to, um, in reference to one-to-one -one, uh, student device program, uh, this year, sixth and, and ninth grade, students were given a Dell Latitude device instead of a Microsoft Surface device. Uh, the plan for us is to continue that uh, for the next year and to keep really the three to four year replacement cycle at the middle school and the high school. Uh, we, uh, we found out that with the surface uh, uh, goes, they're very kind of fragile, the edges, so we were seeing a lot of damages uh, to those devices. Actually, I think, um, I, I hate to point, but like we, one building in particular, we're seeing a high rate of damage device, so we're trying to we actually went out and, and um, looked for devices that were a bit more sturdier, so the Dell, Dell latitudes have a better, better edges. They're not they're rounded, thicker. We got some um, cases also as well with that. So that's the, the primarily the reason why we're moving away from the surface goes. And so we'll continue that trend in the following years. Um, then now moving to cybersecurity. Uh, this year we expanded our MFA multi-factor requirements to two additional of systems uh, for staff only. Uh, most of our staff are using the um, Microsoft Authenticator app. I know you guys are using that as well when you're outside of the uh, network. I, I see Nick smiling. <laughs> 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 so we, we're go doing good. We're added two more applications to that. We're doing it slowly because it, it is an adjustment. Um, the way that works when we're, they're here, they're not asked to do that MFA because we, we're trying to limit um, the interruption to the classroom. They only get so much time, so we want to make sure that uh, there's very little interruption with that. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to continue to evaluate the multi-factor and continue to add more applications to that as well. Um, moving on to our endpoint protection, uh, it continues to detect and prevent malicious attempts on our systems. Uh, since the September of this year, the system detected and prevented 239 ransomware attempts to our systems. So we're continue to monitor that very closely. You know, we have other layers of security besides the endpoint protection, the DNS, um, you know, firewalls, and you know, just it's all about ledgering security. So we're trying to make sure that we're doing our best job. One of the things that we notice, we don't allow. Um, our users to authenticate from outside of the country. That's one of the things that really have helped us kind of keep ourselves. So if we have like any, any need or special need to do allow, we've had like students that have gone out to competition, so we make an exception and we try to do it in a way that is secure, but we really have everything closed down to only allow um, people to log in from the US. So that's one of the things that we, we have implemented. Um, Chris, you can go ahead and move on to the next one. So lease purchase, I, uh, Chris also mentioned that. Lease purchase is how we purchase all of our students and staff devices um, and any type of big ticket items like the um, displays for the classrooms and any type of network equipment for the five-year infrastructure plan. So we use those fun that funding to just be able to do those bigger uh, items uh, pieces. Um, we, in terms of the five-year infrastructure upgrade plan, this year we wrapped up the middle school. So this year with this the second year. Uh, next year it's, we're going to start working on the high school. It's one of it's a, our biggest building, so we have a lot more equipment there. Uh, so that's going to be over the last two years that we're going to upgrade IDFs, uh, MDFs, all, all of us, our switches, some fiber. Uh, you know, going from multi mode to single mode. Uh, so we're doing a lot of that just to make sure that everything is the way it should be. Uh, moving to a layer three, also um, leveraging some of the uh, um, switches that we got from our prior projects that um, 
were done through the um, security and the, and the phone system, so we're just making sure that we're leveraging those better, you know, and adding new stuff. Um, and um, just making sure, this is pretty much all I have, I wanted to highlight tonight. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I really appreciate, Kim. I know you were leading this part of bringing our new partner on board of Vegetech, which you've talked about a great deal this evening. And so um, I would compliment their work as well in, in your partnership with them, because what I've seen is that we have our team from Edutech, but they also do send some folks over to us once in a while to help out with some different work. Even uh, my understanding is sometimes they're training a new employee. I and I always volunteer. Any yeah. training, <laughs> yeah. any training you want, we do. You know, because we get more bodies in house, so I'm always in. Oftentimes, people do um, move on to other opportunities. So we know the person already. They happen to be here. That actually happened once before. And we were able to just, they were able to quickly replace it with the uh, in-house person that we were training just to, you know, help them out a little bit. So it is, a, it is a great partnership that we have going on, but, you know, but I always see benefits for, to that in, in helping each other out. Thank you very much, Ken. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. I just had a quick question. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe Chris could answer it. Um, underneath staffing, technology staffing, mm -hmm. Edutech, there's nine uh, employees, looks like nine positions. Mm -hmm. Are all those going to be covered under the cost of the edge tech? Yes. So we don't. There's no cost to us on these additional. Correct. Yep. Everyone that you see there on that slide. Now is were they covered? We had them employed originally through the district. No. All these through nope. edge tech. Only the one that uh, just the level the one two previous. tech was previously. Yes. So just so everybody knows that all these are going to be added through edge tech according to that cost. They're it's already that cost. They're already here. They're right, already so included the eight in that are cost. Covered and in what that we're paying for them already. And benefits and all that is through. All edutech. Yep. Okay. Correct. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the buildings and grounds budget. Uh, included in here is the safety and security uh, budget as well. <coughs> um, so, just looking at some of these, it's you know the slide is set up similar to technology. Again, we have actual expenses for 22-23, budgeted for 23-24, and then what we're proposing for 24-25. Um, one of the one of the items in that salary line is we've had a maintenance position that was not filled in the 22-23 school year that we are uh, hopefully soon going to be replacing and filling that position, which will then in turn help us uh, maybe minimize some of our costs uh, associated with some of our HVAC uh, contractors that we use. Um, safety and security number there uh, that encompasses our for school resource officers, we have one at each school, as well as the after school security guards that we have at each building, and then there is some uh, nights, uh, some weekend security as well. Uh, BOCI services, uh, you see a, you know, a, a, an increase from the 22-23 actual numbers up through the 23-24, and now the 24-25 budget, uh, that is because we, upgraded our maintenance plan that we had for some of our safety and security items with our contractor. Uh, that, that now is, you know, a few years old. And if there's equipment that is, uh, needs replacement or fixing, uh, all those costs are now covered under that maintenance plan with, with, um, with our contractor through that. Does anybody have any questions on on this? The school resource officers, <clears throat> we pay directly through the district. Yep, yep, and we pay directly to Westchester County. What was the big uh, uplift in BOCI services in 2022 to 2023? Yeah, so that was the, the maintenance plan that we have. That was with, the maintenance plan? Okay. Yep, that not, was the maintenance not plan. Not this year, okay. Yep. I thought this year was the maintenance plan. No, we, we, yeah, we got it in last year, so now it's just kind of standard increases. So now it has to be maintained, you're saying, going forward? Yeah, maintaining that going forward. All right, and then I'm gonna ask uh, Chris McCartney, our Director of Facilities, to come up here, and Dan Corrado, our Safety and Security Coordinator from Alteris, to, to speak about the staff and then some of the services that are provided. Thank you, Chris, Dr. Blanche. 
Uh, thank you, board members, too. I apologize for those of you I haven't met yet. Um, I'll be here uh, five months and a couple more days, and it's, it's really been a great experience so far to, to be here at Somers. I'm really happy to be here, and I look forward to being here for a long time. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so to Chris's point with our, with our custodial staff, um, I'd like to start with that. Um, we are looking at adding uh, two, not adding, actually um, bringing in two uh, night uh, supervisors uh, for both uh, the uh, complexes, one at uh, uptown and one downtown here, um, to replace a couple of jobs that uh, one was a resignation, one was a uh, retirement. Um, so we're looking to bring in a, uh, a night senior in each one of these um, you know, complexes, um, which will act as a point person for myself and also for the head custodian. Um, they will have a full uh, routine every night, um, but they will have the, you know, the option of going to another building if we have a shortcoming, you know, if somebody didn't come to work or something like that. So it's gonna be a great option for the district. Um, and as far as the maintenance crew goes, Chris did mention that, that seventh uh, maintenance worker. Currently we have six on staff. Um, we have our, you know, our, our main electrician, our plumber, our carpenter, um, and the, um, the, uh, the grounds guys. Um, when, I, when I first came on, I, I really thought there was a big need uh, for an HVAC mechanic. Um, and the district, I think, will really uh, benefit from having that position. So I'm glad Chris, I was able to work with Chris to, to make that happen and bring that, you know, bring that employee on. Um, you know, I, I know the um, the next slide, Chris. We we had we had um, the inspections that we do. You know, that we uh, kind of maintain throughout the district. I kind of want to add to those a little bit. In addition to the oil tanks, the PBS stuff is really really huge. Um, we don't have any of that at uh, SIS, but you know the the, the above ground uh, tanks at the uh, bus facility and the underground oil tanks at, at the buildings is a is a big thing with the county. As is the is the water. As you all are aware, we have wells here in Somers, and it's uh, it's a huge undertaking uh, with all of the testing that has to go on, you know, all year round. And now next year, um, by 2025, we have to do the lead. And you know that that's a big thing, and that's actually gotten a lot more stringent too. So you know we're looking to have that done by 2025 as well. And as far as the inspections, you know, in addition to, to what you see up there, we also you know we do the playground inspections, the elevators, uh, the gym divider doors, the fire alarm systems, the sprinkler system at the middle school, a hair reports again, the lead and water. It's it's you know it's it's a lot that we do in, in house here, um, and having the uh, the supervisors, I think, is going to be a tremendous asset. Uh, adding this HVAC, I think, is going to be huge for, for the district. It really is in looking at the numbers. Um, and I'm happy to also report, uh, I'm sure you already know, that we have our new head custodian, Perm Robes. He's actually starting tomorrow, which is fantastic. So that's all I have. Uh, Any questions? Chris? Thank you. All right, Dan, I know you can't get enough of these meetings. It's great to see you back two in a row. It's great. <laughs> Good, good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to be back. Uh, school board and Dr. Blanche, thank you for having me again. Um, so under that security and safety, as far as um, people who are parts of those teams, myself, obviously, and our school resource officers. So um, the fact that we have those folks in our community, I think, is just invaluable, having that asset, having the, the Westchester County Police here in all of our buildings. And you know, just tonight it was a perfect example of the, the support that they bring to the district. And it's, it just <coughs> makes my job actually that much easier, having a, that access to those folks and having their opinions on things and being able to work through projects and having them as fabric of our community uh, is just tremendous. So. Um, kudos to Somers for, for bringing those on and making that happen. Um, I'm not going to touch on all of those because I really touched on pretty much that and then a whole bunch uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but I'm willing to take any questions. But what I do definitely want to mention is that I, it's uh, not up on the screen, but uh, we have that uh, critical response group mapping that was one of the new items that we were uh, currently working on. Uh, last Thursday, we had a, a rep from CRG, the that's the name of the company, who was here. He and I walked um, like uh, 
uh, Mike Lantier was saying like every foot of the building all the way through so that he uh, could document every room, every nook and cranny, look at all the, uh, the numbers on the doors to make sure they all matched up so that once they, uh, those plans get together, uh, where all the cameras were, where all the infrastructure was, shut off valves, electric, water, all those things are for those maps in order to uh, make a, a better response for law enforcement in, in the event of a critical situation. So uh, that is really that project is moving forward, and I would anticipate we'll have uh, the draft plans for those uh, fairly uh, fairly soon. So. Um, that's about all I have. I really said too easily oh, probably everything I really want to do, covering all those topics So just any questions that the board has, um, please. Are, are there any plans for um, backup systems? So if power goes out in order to keep the doors locked and um, locked down to put the school into lockdown, or I know if there's no generator, or there's no power, do we have something in place for that, like sort of backups, battery backups or anything? Or do we so, plan on getting that? Do we have it? Or? So I did ask uh, about that question because we did have that power outage last week yeah. as to what those systems would do. Uh, the short answer is I can't give you a 100% answer exactly what's going to happen. There is some battery backup in the lockdown system. So um, depending where that battery level is, it will give us a certain amount of time that it may operate for us in the event of a power outage in the uh, Pr Primrose and SIS, in those two buildings uh, without the generators. So um, it may or may not, it, I, I can't give you a solid answer as to uh, how long they may work under those conditions. Okay. Um, but th it would definitely be a challenge should, uh, should we lose the power in those buildings and need to do that. Is that something we're gonna be looking at to rectify? Uh, I'm sure that we can so, certainly talk actually, about Actually, Dan, that. you were here when we were a part of that project. We had a community-based safety and security group, and the uh, generators to add to the safety and security piece was an item, and that group at that time uh, determined not to bring it up. That was a multi-million dollar project then. I'm not sure what it would be now. Honestly, I don't want to put estimates around it, but that was a piece that that group came forward and said, with that piece, we'd be holding on not putting those as generators in because of the cost mm -hmm. and the, the likelihood of us losing power when we're in here and I can't I think the first time this is the first time that I'm aware of that been here this time that we've lost power with these new devices in place here in that time so I think that was a part for those energy surges and stuff that we're looking at just uh, it was it was kind of cost prohibitive at that time so when the power goes out what happens to like the swipe access into the building or into the classrooms does that still work we had mixed uh mixed reviews on that on some places they did work on some places they did not work i think that also goes towards where what the battery level is on those backups that are in there because there is batteries on, on all the locks so it kind of um, and whether or not a sub panel goes down if a sub panel goes down um, that can also affect the ability to different groups of doors uh, not operate properly so we did I did had kind of had both ways in the buildings some they were down and some they weren't so it was definitely a mix review and I think the team has started to look at we'll work with our architect team as well too just to determine if there's a, a, a middle ground or a different version of the ability to go ahead and like get those sub panels and some of those other ones uh, ability to get power versus a rather large generator like at this building at the high school so they're kind of getting an initial uh, baseline assessment of what it would take Dan and the team are still trying to determine exactly which kind of which ones would we're not aligned directly so once we get that we'll have a ballpark number it's not gonna be a small number but we'll, we'll at least getting that information now to determine that so the current ones now they power the whole school or just sections the middle school the generators. And high school not a whole but they will will go ahead and do most of those technology closets they'll go ahead and do the sub panels and things like that so yes a significant majority of the uh, I guess the the heart the of the, the building critical infrastructure so, yep mm. So like lighting in the hallway, water, that kind of stuff. Yep, and that's a piece where we're looking at those campuses because again, as you know, uh, Chris mentioned before about us being on well and septic, <coughs> we have the uh, you know those pumps, so right. we have some water in the system for a while, uh, and so it, it goes. I'm trying to think. The last time it was an early release, maybe nine years ago, maybe it was ten years ago. Time flies. Uh, when we had uh, to make a determination because those pumps did go down. 
And so we were able to go ahead and maintain the rest of the day, but we used like bottled water and things like that. So uh, we, we don't lose that very often, but uh, we're looking at both of those elements because again, both of those presented themselves. And now with Chris New on board and the team, he's looking at that for getting the uh, kind of the water system working at both those campuses and then looking at the kind of sub, uh, sub panels and things like that for the uh, swipe card access. So once we get a sense, we'll, we'll kind of work with architects and say what that number, again, ballpark would look like now, so. Right, because you can't stay in school if there's no water, like working water, right? As far as like there's a There's a short safety. duration of time, right, right. Yep. And that's where, again, honestly, when this went down, we were, had to make a determination. Right, no, <laughs> I, so that's. So much amount of time we can keep kids in school or not, so, yeah. Right, it's a health and safety code violation, I imagine, yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So we're going to move over to the transportation budget for next year. Uh, our assistant director of transportation, Gerard Esposito, could not be here tonight, so I will just walk us through some of this. Um, salaries here, again, it's on the next slide as well, but just a reminder, um, we don't, the monitor, the bus monitors are district employees, but the bus drivers are not. They, we contract through Royal Coach for that. Um, and you see on that contract transportation line uh, an increase. Um, part of that was based on the decision last year to um, amend the contract with Royal Coach. And uh, now the district pays for the fuel. And uh, again, the reason to amend the contract last year uh, was if we didn't, we would have to go out for another RFP, a request for proposal, and the increases that uh, surrounding districts were seeing were in the 25 to 35% increases. So um, we had a we have a longstanding relationship with Royal Coach, so we had the discussions with them and we were able to work out um, the amendments that were made. And uh, it's been beneficial, I think, for, for both us and Royal Coach. How much is the added cost of the fuel? Fuel? How much of this number? Of this number, um, I want to say maybe close to three hundred thousand. Um, there's some that take uh, some buses that take diesel, and then some vans that take uh, just regular gas. But somewhere around two fifty to three hundred thousand. <coughs> and just a quick overview of the staff here: we have the assistant director of transportation, and then he has an administrative assistant in his office, and then we have the bus monitors that are part-time bus monitors. Again, all Somers employees. And then with Royal Coach, we have approximately 50 bus drivers. And then down at the uh, bus garage um, at the transportation facility, we have a terminal manager, a dispatcher, safety manager, and then two mechanics on site. So Chris, just to be clear, so then the, the 630,000 would be on the Central Somers School District side, right? And then the contract transportation, that's covered in Royal Co on the Royal Coach side. Yep. So all those salaries on the right are covered on that contract transportation line. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then just to highlight a few things, um, again, approximately 680,000 miles driven per year. I think that's a lot of miles if it's just the 34 in-district routes, because how can you go that many miles when we don't, we're not a very large town? Um, but there's also out-of-district routes that we have for special education, um, which those routes could be lengthy. Um, we go up to Statsburg, and we go to Connecticut, we go to Rockland County, you know, we're kind of all over the map here. Um, and then we also have uh, trips for field trips and athletic games. Uh, and then one other thing with this bus patrol program, uh, this was something that we helped pilot for Westchester County um, the last couple years, and then Westchester County uh, ultimately uh, passed the law that now all the school buses will have these stop arm cameras um, on their buses. So it was something that uh, we were at the forefront of, and um, you know, and did help help the county, um, you know, push the county a little bit to to pass that. Uh, to help kind of slow down some of the motorists that are passing our school buses because the amount that pass when the stop sign is out is quite alarming. So has the ticketing mm -hmm. started? Uh, I believe so. Uh, 
again, the district doesn't see any revenue for it. Right. But uh, the hope so we also that, didn't have to pay yeah. to get the bus <laughs> patrol cameras on either, right? We did not have to pay a right. dime to get the cameras on there. <coughs> Again, for us, it's just hopefully slowing down some motorists to keep our students safe. Peace. Yep. Now on to one of my favorite topics each year, um, benefits. <laughs> uh, so we did kind of touch upon this even in the presentation in December. Again, this is uh, a large bucket for us in the budget, and we continue to see some significant increases. Um, the bulk of it you're looking at is that middle line with the health insurance um, line that's going from 15.5 million up to about 17 million. Um, I'll touch upon a little bit just in a little bit more detail, but overall, just for our health benefits here. Uh, we're looking at about a $1.9 million increase next year, or just over 7%. And just to go into a little bit more detail, again, this is just similar to what we touched upon in December. Uh, New York State Teachers Retirement, we're still waiting for that range. Uh, currently, we're at 9.76%. That is the employer contribution rate. And uh, we're just waiting for TRS to really release that final number, um, hopefully in the next couple weeks, so then we can uh, finalize that budget amount. Uh, New York State Employees Retirement System, we do have that percentage. It's going to go from 13.1 to 15.2 percent. And then the really the driving factor in, in these numbers that we're seeing, these increases, is our health insurance. Um, so our Empire Plan, which is our nice ship plan for teachers, um, that is run on a calendar year. So for 2024, we saw an aggregate increase of about 12 percent. So, and this is consistent with last year, it was even higher. Um, so for 2025, we're projecting an increase of about 14 percent. And then the la other plan is the PN Putnam Northern Westchester Health Benefits Consortium plan. That is for all other staff that are not teachers. Um, and we did set that rate at five and a half percent for next year. And that is on a fiscal year, unlike the Empire Plan, which is on a calendar year. And these health insurance plans are part of the um, collectively, collectively bargained agreements. Um, you know, we are looking at possible other options that could be beneficial for the district and for um, staff. But uh, for right now, we are kind of locked into these plans for, for the various staff members. And then just to kind of sum up each one of the expenditure increases that we touched upon tonight, your total is just shy of 3.3 million, which on our current budget is about a 3.1% increase or just under 8% on the non-instructional budget. Um, so again, and these are, many of these items are kind of, uh, especially the health insurance is kind of out of our control. We don't set the rates for, you know, health insurance. Um, we do collect, you know, we do negotiate with the unions on employee versus employer contribution rates, but again, we're we're in the middle of our contracts with them, but the overall premium increases again are not set by us. Um, so, unfortunately, that that large benefit number of just over 1.9 million, uh, there's not much uh, control that we have over that number. And that's more than half of the increase in our yeah. instru non-instructional budget. Right. Hmm. All right, and that kind of sums up the non-instructional budget. Uh, and then looking forward to our February 13th meeting, uh, it's gonna be on our instructional budget. Uh, so we're gonna look to have a little breakdown between each of the schools and our special education department and highlight some of those items. Um, so that'll be our presentation in February. And then we do have some of the upcoming meeting topics here. Uh, March 12th will be a budget development workshop. And then March 26th is kind of our budget summary where we kind of bring it all together, non-instructional and instructional. Um, and then April 16th is just to finalize those numbers. And then that is where the board would adopt the budget. And then uh, May 7th, we have our public budget hearing, all leading to our public budget and trustee vote in May of 20, May 21st of this year. And that is all I got. That's it. Oh, that's it. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Good. Uh, okay. Right, that's on budget, right? That's it. All right. Thank you.
Um, all right, uh, committee liaison reports. Anybody from the committees want to, uh, that have met recently? I know the planning committee. Um, I mean, we pretty much met about all of this, so I don't know how, like, you know. Unless you want us to reiterate more. everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, this is like my fifth <laughs> time <laughs> seeing this document, <laughs> actually, so. <laughs> how much is the EduTech budget going up in two years? <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about that all night. <laughs> Um, yeah, and policy is meeting this Friday, so we don't have an update. Okay. And then um, West Putt School Board, I did the Board of Directors meeting, and really the big topic of conversation was some of the, the budget implications. Um, and then Amanda and I were both at the um, community conversations that they had on communication, which was really interesting. It was. But when they have those, they're having another community conversation um, in April on civics which I think is gonna be a really interesting topic too. Um, so that's one to keep an eye out for because these are free and any board member can sign up for them when they're on Zoom. Um, and what else did they have that was coming up? Hang on. Oh, I did sign up for next week's Westchester Putnam School Board Association legislative one where they meet with um, our school board superintendents and, um, and the local legislatures to discuss the, the governor's budget and things like that. So hopefully I can bring back some Maybe good, some, some helpful news. information. I, I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah, and the communication one was just last night, so I'll, I can write up and Amanda and I can share our notes together yeah. on uh, any key thing, key takeaways, talking to people from different districts and what's what's working and what's not. Great. Thank you both for taking the time and doing that. Uh, all right. With that, we'll go on to the uh, financial reports. There's nothing to, uh, I think we just to just just note, acknowledge them. All right, done. Uh, all right, on to the approval of the meeting minutes. Let it be resolved that the Board of Education, having received copies of the minutes uh, of the meetings for 12 12 23 and 1 9 24, hereby approves the same. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> abstain? All right, board action. On to personnel consent agenda. Let it be resolved that the Board of Education, upon recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, hereby approves the attached personnel agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Uh, CSC CPSC meeting recommendations. Let it be resolved the Board of Education have received copies of the recommendations of the meetings as listed on the attached memo hereby approves the same. Uh, the cost for these services are contained, budgeted in the 2023-24 budget. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstained, objections? All right, business consent agenda. Uh, let it be resolved the Board of Education upon recommendation of the superintendent of schools hereby approves the attached business agenda. So moved. Second. No questions. Okay. No, no. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Stay in objections. All right. Uh, the reg the uh, calendar, Somerset Central School District calendar for 2024-25. Uh, let it be resolved that uh, upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education of the Somerset Central School <coughs> District hereby adopts the 2024-25 school calendar for the Somerset Central School District as presented. All in favor? Uh, sorry. So moved. Second. And that was, I didn't notice any changes from there was not the private meeting. Right? Okay. Yeah. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain, objections? All right, uh, stipulation of settlement. Let it be resolved that the superintendent of school hereby authorizes and empowers to execute the stipulation of settlement signed on January 6, 2024 by the parents of student uh, XXX and the superintendent is further authorized to take all action necessary to effective uh, the terms of this agreement. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Stand objections. All right, policy first reading. I resolve that upon recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education of Somer Central School District does hereby accept the following new policy for first reading. 8130.2, Workplace Violence Prevention. So moved. Second. Do we comment on this or? So just, uh, this is a new policy that uh, all school districts have to go ahead and put in place and so along with this also, there's a training that will take place by 
the middle of March, we'll have that completed there as well. So policy committee will be looking at this for a final touch this Friday. I would not anticipate any changes, but we'll bring it forth for the hopefully uh, adoption in the February meeting. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Stained objections? Aye. All right, now we open up to public comment. All right, no takers on that. Uh, we'll go to board member comments. Well, sure, I'll, I'll start uh, as we're talking about the budget. I just want to, you know, you know we're going through the non-instructional areas and, and <coughs> the people that we've gotten there, you know, by providing our technology, the buildings and grounds. I mean, I, I'm always proud with how our place looks. We have special events and, and I see our, our, our people out there. Um, working hard and, and keeping the place looking great. Safety team, transportation, I just want to say I appreciate all the work <coughs> that goes into that. Um, and I also want to say, Chris, I, I like how you've presented this. Uh, you've broken it out into those areas last year, what we've got now, looking at this year. The explanation, I think it ties it together in a really, uh, in a way that helps us be thoughtful and, and take a look at that. So. I Thank appreciate you. those changes and anyone else who had input in mm -hmm. how that came about. I like it. It was helpful. <coughs> Me? Yeah, yeah I, I think the presentations are good. That's the right direction. We're looking forward to more details, of course, on different categories. Um, I just have a little philosophical comment on that. I like to see the budget and the actual, um, certainly we want to manage as closely as possible. Um, in the past, we do over budget just to make sure we don't go into deficit. But in the tight years and <coughs> inflation, you know, high inflation period, we really have to be uh, really careful, okay? I mean, the numbers seem to be a little bit um, spread a little larger than uh, usual. The second comment I have on is the, on the policy. Um, I think this number, whatever number is, uh, this 138.2 policy, is a good English uh, assignment for our, at least our high school students, because I think the language on the second paragraph really, really deserves some English teacher and student to look at it. Could be a very good homework to see whether uh, we'll learn something from it. Uh, I advise every, you know, anybody interested to read that second paragraph. It's almost like one paragraph is one sentence with <coughs> punctuations that, in a way, that uh, make you a headache. <laughs> so I think that was interesting. Uh, since we are on the first reading, I, <laughs> I propose that um, anybody interested in English um, We'll take a look of it, and perhaps even giving feedback to the board. It will be helping the board to to do this piece. Thank you. Anybody else? You good? You no, 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 just thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Questions? Thanks for all that the detailed information. It's a little overwhelming when you see some of the numbers sometimes of what it costs to run the school district, and then all the work that still has to be done. But I appreciate. Um, that careful work of the timing to kind of have one bond paid off and put another one on so that it's not huge fluctuations in, in the budget amount and proactively getting the things done so that we don't end up in emergency situations. Um, so, and I, you know, and knowing that we're going to be going through that and prioritizing, we're not mm -hmm. doing all of it, figuring <laughs> out what really has to happen. So, looking forward to those conversations. Um, I was just going to say that, um, well, first of all, I appreciate all the presentations tonight. I, it's always nice to hear that our, you know, someone say that our district is the gold standards in terms of safety and, um, and precautions as far as the building's uh, conditions are concerned. So that's always a, a positive to hear. Um, and I also really want to also reiterate that I really appreciate the new format um, of how we're attaching the numbers and tying them into what the school's providing because I think it really helps create that picture so people have that understanding instead of, you know, just seeing numbers in the abstract is not always helpful, um, especially as our budgets, you know, always continue to unfortunately have to rise. Um, 
And I also just wanted to say that last week we had a SEPTA meeting with a guest speaker, Dr. Burton, in which he discussed mindfulness, resiliency, and ADHD. And it was a great discussion about, and what really stuck with me was how the doctor noted it's not motivation alone that gets kids to accomplish their tasks. And the analogy he used was that we all can't be, um, we, we can all desire to be a piano mover, but the want or desire to have that alone is not gonna be enough to get that done. We're, not, we not all, not, we're all not gonna have that physical capability to move pianos. So, um, you know, everyone wants to do well, but skills are needed to stay resilient. And for, he noted how a child with ADHD and executive functioning skills um, can be as much as a third behind their chronological age. And that being said, all kids need executive functioning skills. I'm a big proponent of this. I I've, I've, think I've said this a million times, I feel like. Um, but all kids need the brain manager where effort, emotion, task, information, et cetera, come into balance. So I wanna just say that I think it's really great that our school district is really making that a priority um, and how they we're explicitly teaching these executive functioning skills to all kids and recognizing that it's a foundation to learning. Um, you know, it really ties back to the wellness summit back in November and how, you know, it's being taught in all the classrooms and time management and breaking things down. And I just think that's a really great thing, so. Good. Uh, all right, uh, I'll, I'll go quick, but yeah, no, it was good to see the comprehensive plan and the, look, we have a good cadence. Uh, with everything, the maintenance that's happening in the buildings, right? The fact that we're satisfactory across all that stuff, um, you know, and maintaining a flat, consistent bond, you know, over the years and projected to go to to do that forward. Uh, I think that's a good, healthy sign of, you know, how we're continuing and investing in it, right? Uh, and you do want to see that balance of, you know, we'd probably be overspending if everything was excellent yeah. <laughs> um, and underspending if stuff was poor, but it, it's, a, it's a good, it looks like the right balance, so it's good to see. Uh, nice job on the forward thinking for the edutech piece of it. Um, again, the, the, like the, the cost savings and the boilers and all that stuff, this appears to be another one that we get to take advantage of over the years. Um, so looking forward to see how that works out. Um, I mean, everything else good, the budget, you know, uh, it's disappointing that we're getting hit, you know, with the 7.3 you know, uh, percent increase out of something completely out of our control and nothing that we've changed on our end here. Uh, and I think I just did quick math on it. I think it's about 17.3 over the last two years percent increase on what was 25% of our budget is now going to be about roughly about 30% of our budget. Um, you know, I would hope you know some of these legislative com you know, conversations that we're having and our legislators do take note of some of these increases and start making changes there as opposed to you know some of the other mm -hmm. stuff that's getting pushed down. Uh, because it's going to be hard to continue to keep up with uh, the budget at this rate, you know. But thank you. Thanks, Dave. I guess the thing, and, and Chad, you got me thinking about it too. Just um, tonight with the non-instructional site, just uh, these buildings would not be open and available for learning if that team wasn't always there. So having the technology team there, it's, oh, it's great. You know, there's hundreds of devices and all the things will be like that and all the keeping everything safe and so the instructional side keeps working. So I want to thank, you know, our EdgeTech team and our, uh, they are, you know, they are EdgeTech, but they're here in Somers and they're, you know, part of the Somers family and certainly came with her leadership there as well too. And then certainly with Chris being on the district now uh, for um, six months, and we'll just go to six months, Chris, <laughs> six months, and with the team there, uh, and you know, just last few days we've had some challenges with weather and back and forth. Related. The team's here at four o'clock, four thirty in the morning, getting set and ready and prepared, doing the salt, doing all the things. We may or may not open, but they're preparing us for everything we possibly to get it ready. So I just want to thank that team. And it's like it's everybody, not just oh, you know, if somebody who's maybe working on our carpentry, they're here to make sure the building's open. Everybody on the team is here. So again, I just want to say that those pieces. It sounds like yeah, it's it's not instructional it's critical to allow the instructional to happen so i just want to say thanks to to that team and we know we may have some days and we've got an early morning call tomorrow probably more just what the weather looks like but we'll figure that out as well too and stuff so and again I want to thank you for our administrators also trying to be flexible and our teachers with we we don't always know it sometimes again it's always a piece where families whatever reason choose that you know i'm just not comfortable that the schools then, then they would just keep their children home and then call the school and let them know that's the decision they've made. So obviously it's a lot different driving in a car versus driving in a bus around our street. So we're, that's what we're always thinking about is our bus transportation 
not can I get that student school with those buses. So again, thanking transportation as well. Gerard is outstanding as well. So he is out there with his team looking at the roads first thing in the morning, talking to buses, talking to our partners in the town as well. So we're Chris is most often on the phone with our partners in the town. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What's happening out on the road? So it's it's like, are we open or closed? That's kind of, but there's a lot more <laughs> that our team does to it. So I just want to compliment today on, you know, this non-instructional side of the budget, that that's just a simple, uh, small part of what happens in these mornings in the winter along with everything else. So, And thank you, board, for the feedback for Chris and myself and the team. And so uh, this is very helpful that tonight was a, is a good presentation and we presented it well. Then we got carry that over to the instructional conversation we come back in February. So thank you very much for the feedback walking into it and then coming out of that. And so hopefully, and we can always adjust, but it seems like we've got a good spot for the next spot. So thank you. Oh, Ray, I forgot. Kim mentioned that we have this 297 ransomware issue. Do you think we need to review this sort of type of cyber uh, uh, problems? That Do we have any serious problem or just just this is a random? Yeah, so kind of that would be Edgetech and Kim and the team. They're doing that, and by putting that next layering in there, we've been able to stop that. We not, don't have any serious problems. Oh, you know, no, gosh, okay. no, no. So those were all stopped. Yes. Right. Because 297 sounds a lot. Almost every day you have But they were stopped. Somewhere. But they were stopped. That's the key. <laughs> all right. Uh, let it be resolved. This regular meeting of the Board of Education be adjourned. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye.